people enjoyed being around him because, hey, mob guys love Sinatra. First of all, he was Italian. You know, mob guys, <laughs> we're Italian. We love other Italians, just the way it goes, especially seeing them succeed. So, but connected, what does that mean? Because there's a friendship involved? No. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. All is very good, very blessed on this end. As always, we give God all the praise, honor, glory, and thanksgiving for that. And I really mean that. A couple of quick things. The contest, dinner with me, flying you out to Newport Beach, gonna put you in a hotel. Got a great Italian restaurant, yes. Good friend of mine, we're gonna sit down, have dinner, do a Q&A, sign some books, take some photographs, gonna be great. If you have a uh, spouse, we might fly your spouse out with you. And there's a lot of people entering the contest. I'm gonna look forward to it. So uh, go to franziswine.com for the rules, let it happen. May 19th, I'm gonna be in Tampa, Florida, big leadership conference with John Maxwell. Great guy, you're gonna love it. Just look for details. I think we'll be posting them someplace. I'll have it on social media. And uh, I was in Utah, amazing. A Couple of days ago, the snow is like still five feet high. They'll have snow there until June. And uh, we were in a uh, um, you know, beautiful area there and uh, people were skiing. Every mountain I went by, people were skiing. It was great. Uh, I sat down with uh, John from Papa John's, the founder of Papa John's. Great story, great guy, billionaire, earned every buck every dollar of it, but it was a real interesting interview. I think you'll be seeing it. So what are we gonna do today? You know, I have a tremendous amount of respect for entertainers that have been on top for such a long time. Frankie Valli, I love Frankie Valli. He's been on top since the 1960s, over 60 years. You go and see a Frankie Valli concert right now, sold out. I don't care where you go, sold out. I love him and I have a great story about him. I think I told you when I was on trial with Giuliani, he came into the courtroom. He was right by the rail. I was obviously sitting in the defendant's table and uh, we go for a break and he leans over and gives me a hug and the jury's watching him. And I end up getting acquitted in that case, right? And I always say, nobody's gonna convict a good friend of Frankie, Frankie Valley. Everybody loves him, but uh, terrific. And today I wanna talk about who else? Frank Sinatra, amazing. and. I wanna talk about you know, his alleged mob ties, and we're gonna talk about that. And let me make this clear, in no way am I being disparaging in any way to Frank Sinatra. Love the guy, he was brilliant, a tremendous entertainer. You know, when he was in his 80s in Madison Square Garden, we didn't hardly sing, sold out the place. People loved him, he was iconic, he was just, just brilliant. I had the pleasure of meeting him a couple of times, originally at the Copacabana with my dad when we used to go there. I loved the Copa. I met everybody there. But he was a gentleman. He liked my dad a lot. I met him a few times there. I met him in Vegas. I met him, you know, at the Italian American Civil Rights League when he came and entertained for Joe Colombo. And uh, for me, great guy, but a brilliant entertainer. You know, when he died, it was May 14th, 1998. I remember exactly where I was. I was laying in bed when I heard it you know, come over the uh, uh, news that he had passed away. And for me, it was like an era died. It was just, that was it. There was a club in Long Island I used to go to all the time. Paulie Vario had a piece of it, and I loved the place. It was called Channel 80, and it had an upstairs. It was right on the channel, you know, on the water, uh, Channel 80. And uh, I had the whole upstairs floor. I used to be up there with 40, 50 of my friends. We have it, they would close it off for us. But at the end of the night, whenever I was there, we would close the uh, uh, night out with New York, New York by Frank Sinatra, and everybody would sing. It was just, I have such great memories of that. Anyway, I'm gonna get into it today. I came across an article I thought was interesting, so I'm gonna read the article, and I'm gonna put my uh, two cents, my commentary in at certain spots, and I think you're gonna enjoy it. Frank Sinatra's mob ties and other secrets from his FBI file. The FBI documented Old Blue Eyes every move for 40 years. Now, why would they be following Sinatra for 40 years? He wasn't a terrorist, he wasn't a communist, he was a singer, he was an entertainer, a brilliant entertainer. Did he hang out with some mob guys? Did he rub shoulders with them? 
Yeah, what's wrong with that? You know, they say the thing, same thing about Donald Trump. Donald Trump was involved with the mob. Why? Because uh, Roy Cohen was his attorney, because he had to deal with the mob, you know, in his contracting business in New York, like everybody else, like Leona Helmsley, like Gutterman, like all the big contractors, had to deal with the unions, so they had to deal with us. Sometimes not them personally, you know, sometimes it was people under them, but they had to deal with us. Well, Trump, the same thing. And there was a lot of talk about, I had issues with him. I, I, I want to get into all the Trump stuff. But, you know, because he rubbed shoulders with some of the mob guys, you know, they had a, a, a file on him for 40 years. They were really interested in him. They saw Frank Sinatra as a threat. Threat for what? I don't get it. You know, sometimes they really go overboard, you know? A threat for what? And let me tell you something. What's wrong with hanging out with some mob guys? We would go in and make sure that we went to see him. And we didn't go there for free. We paid our way. My dad went into the copa. He spent money. You don't get anywhere in life without spending money. Trust me. You're a mob guy. They love my dad because he spent money. They love me because when I went in there, I went in with a bunch of guys. And we spent money. You know, we filled the place. We spent money. You know, so an entertainer appreciates that when you're going to see him. So, yeah, okay. He had associations. But let me get into the article. Frank Sinatra was many things. He was a crooner who could make Bobby Sox's faint, an Academy Award-winning actor. We forget that sometimes. The older statesman of the Rat Pack. Who doesn't remember the Rat Pack my age? Brilliant. You'll never duplicate an act like that ever again. At the height of his career, it was rumored that every woman wants to have him and every man wants to be him. Okay. But his fans and detractors weren't the only people who wanted a piece of old blue eyes. So did the FBI. It's astonishing how much they tracked him and what a huge file they had on him. The FBI uh, tracked Sinatra for over 40 years, amassing a dossier of, a thousands, of thousands of pages about his movements, his words, and his friendships. The files, which were made public after he died in 1998, cover Sinatra throughout his tempestuous career and read like a thrilling account of a life he led his way. My way. What a, you know, Paul Anka was so brilliant. Paul Anka's a brilliant songwriter. But he wrote this song, My Way. Brilliant song. And rather than sing it himself, because he's an entertainer too, a brilliant song, he knew it would be a hit. He gives it to Sinatra, and it becomes legendary. I mean, My Way. Every time I hear that song, I think of it. I like to think of it, that I've led, you know, this life my way most of the time. Anyhow, every guy wants to know that. Sinatra rose to fame during the 1940s, as soon attracted the attention of the FBI, right when he rose to fame, proclaims that he paid a doctor $40,000 to declare him medically unfit for World War II service. Okay. Though the FBI dismissed the allegations, calling his exemption for a punctured eardrum, he did have a punctured eardrum, and psychological issues legitimate, rumors that he dodged the draft persisted throughout his lifetime, even hurt his career in the late 1940s, wasn't true. He absolutely had a punctured eardrum. That makes it even more amazing that he sang, you know, the way he did. And that's why he was exempted from the draft. You know, my father always got upset because they said that they threw him out. He was dishonorably discharged from the Army. It bothered him his whole life. And at one point in time, because they said he had psychotic tendencies, I remember my dad telling me one time, he was a cook, right? And uh, he goes to his sergeant and he says, I didn't come here to cook. I came here to go over and fight the enemy. He said, that's who I want to kill. And if I don't go to start killing the enemy, I'm going to start killing American soldiers. That's what he told him. And that's when they allegedly tossed him out. But later on, it was uh, found out that he really was honorably discharged. So they make these stories up. His excuse for not serving may have been watertight, but Sinatra's tries to, ties to known mafia members and a revolving cast of characters connected to the underworld weren't as squeaky clean. What does that mean? Because he was around some of the mob guys weren't as squeaky clean? You know, I explained that a little bit, but let's get into it more. Sinatra's FBI file reads like a guide to the era's organized crime figures. Though Sinatra always denied he was connected to the mob, now, what does that mean, connected? We'll get into that in a minute. He did interact with famous mafia figures like Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana, with whom he was close friends. And he was. But what do you mean connected? Because you know people? You're connected in some way? Was he paying them money? Was he paying tribute to the mob? No, he wasn't. And I know that for a fact. He was his own man. People enjoyed being around him because, hey, mob guys love Sinatra. 
First of all, he was Italian. You know, mob guys, <laughs> we're Italian, we love other Italians, just the way it goes, especially seeing them succeed. So, but connected, what does that mean? Because there's a friendship involved? No. Sinatra supposedly introduced Giancana to John F. Kennedy's campaign in 1960 in an attempt to deliver union votes to the future president. Absolutely true. 100 percent true. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? So if Sam Giancana wanted uh, Kennedy to be president and he was uh, helped him go out and get votes, <laughs> they do that all the time. At least they're not stuffing the ballot, you know, with phony votes. These were legitimate votes from the union, not like what's happening, you know, uh, at least allegedly today. According to Sinatra's daughter, Tina, he played a gig at Jan Connor's Chicago Club to repay that favor. Sinatra also introduced Kennedy to Judith, Judith Campbell Exner, Jan Connor's girlfriend. Very true. During the years-long affair that followed, Exner allegedly acted as a liaison between Kennedy and Jan Connor, helping in a plot for the mob to assassinate Fidel Castro. Again, absolutely true. The CIA approached the mob, and yes, there was a plan to assassinate Castro. Obviously, it didn't happen, but that was in the works, and it was brought to them by the CIA. It never did, but Exner later testified before a Senate committee investigating JFK's potential mob ties. Okay, mob ties, again. Sinatra had other mafia friends, many of whom can be found in his FBI files, which contain headings like associations with criminals and hoodlums, and accusations of being a dope racketeer. Not true. He never dealt with drugs. Now, I don't know what that means, a dope racketeer, but if it had anything to do with drugs, absolutely not true. There are accounts of gifts from Joseph and Charles Fischetti, brothers with the Chicago outfit who ran illegal gambling operations. That's true. He knew them. There's a Godfather-style appearance at an Atlantic City club as a favor for attendees of the wedding of the daughter of Philadelphia mobster Angelo Bruno. Okay, so what? There's even documentation of the mob exerting pressure on Sinatra's behalf to release him from a 1951 contract. We saw that immortalized where? In The Godfather. Everybody thought that that was based upon Sinatra's life. And you know what? I believe there's truth to that. That was in 1951, the year I was born. But I did hear about that afterwards, that uh, he did get helped. And you know why? Because he was Italian, because he was a singer. And if we could have helped somebody, we did. I think I told the story once before. Frank Sinatra Jr. was playing at the San Suzanne, a club out in Long Island that my father first had involvement than I did later on. Well, Frank Sinatra Jr. goes to play there the first night. Hardly anybody showed up. We got a call. Hey, Frank Sinatra Jr. is playing there. Can we help him out? So the next two nights, we filled up the place. Well, he appreciated that. You know, we made everybody go. We supported him. They paid, but, you know, what does that mean? Because we liked the guy, so we took care of him. He, in turn, did favors for us. But was he involved? Was he an associate? Was he paying us? Did he owe us anything? No. I mean, maybe to return a favor, but don't you do that in normal life? Somebody does something for you? Hey, I owe you. I'd like to repay you in some way, shape, or form. Uh, it wasn't an obligation, but, yeah, he did it. So what? FBI agents also watched Sinatra's carouse with Detroit mobsters Anthony and Vito Giacalone. It was like clockwork, retired FBI agent Sam Ruffino tells author Scott Bernstein. A few times a year, we'd trail the Giacalones to the airport to pick up Sinatra. They'd spend the weekend together socializing before and after his shows. Almost every night, they'd shut the place down. And he didn't make any apologies for it. Sinatra didn't apologize for that. These were his friends. So what? The fact that they were known hoodlums and murderers, well, they got to throw that in, didn't matter to him. He didn't care. He was going to hang around with who he wanted to hang around with. Well, they threw in the murderers, you know, but that's an FBI agent talking. Sinatra flaunted his friendships with people connected to organized crime, took plenty of public photographs with known mobsters. Yes, he did. His gangster friends shared his passions, gambling, women, money, and they often met in casinos and nightclubs. So if they had similar interests, he was a night guy, obviously. He was singing late at night. He'd hang out in casinos. He was always in a club. He was around those type of guys. So what? They had fun together, okay? Well, they're mobsters. Well, you think a lot of people didn't hang out with mobsters? You think it was only Sinatra? I have to tell you this. A lot of people enjoyed being in our company, you know? <laughs> Look, we always, uh, you know, had 
ringside seats or wherever we were, whatever club we went into. People respected us, and people liked to be around us, and we had fun when we went out. You know, I told uh, about John Gotti. John was tough to work with, you know, in a business deal. He wasn't really an astute business guy. You know, kind of a nightmare, I'd say that. He was tough, but go out with him, a lot of fun. You know, like a lot of guys, you'd have a lot of fun. Have a couple of drinks, he'd talk, we'd joke, a lot of fun. And yeah, of course, women hang out. Women, let me tell you something, women want to be around men. I don't want to get into all of that, that's another video, but women want to be around men that are strong, that present themselves as being men. Sinatra, however, offered to snitch on some of the criminals he hung around with. In 1950, he sent an associate to J. Edgar Hoover to offer Sinatra's services as an informant, perhaps in an attempt to protect himself from swirling rumors that he was involved with the mob. The FBI declined. One of Hoover's aides wrote, we want nothing to do with him on the report of the meeting. I don't think that's accurate. I think what might have happened, something did happen. I heard a little bit about this. He wasn't an informant. He wasn't trying to put people in trouble, but there was an incident that had occurred that Sinatra had some information on that would have been helpful to the, to the FBI, not necessarily against the mob guys. That's what I heard. I can't verify it. I wasn't there. You hear things second and third hand sometimes on the street, but that's what I heard. Nobody ever, ever, ever labeled Sinatra an informant. Sinatra was never prosecuted for criminal behavior in connection to his many mob ties. Why should he be? What did he do wrong? He didn't do anything wrong. He was never brought before the House Un-American Activities Commission either, but the FBI had him in its sights for what they considered to be suspicious activity with possible ties to communism. Communism, that was during the Red Scare, remember? Back in the 50s, 60s, you know, everybody in Hollywood was a communist. They were investing, they, investigating a lot of different people at times. time. Sinatra happened to be one of them. No truth to it whatsoever. The FBI file is filled with accounts of Sinatra's supposedly suspicious activities. This is the FBI. From his support of anti-racist initiatives, and let me get into that. He was absolutely anti-racist. Remember, he's the guy that supported Sammy Davis Jr. to the nth degree. If Sammy was told he couldn't go into a place, Frank wouldn't go in either. And he said, you want me here? You bring my brother Sammy here. He was absolutely anti-racist. He was great in that regard. Anti-racist initiatives to his defense of people accused of being communists. His friends, they accuse him of being communist. He says, no, he supported them. He stood up for the underdog, Sinatra did, all the time. Sinatra was one of the founding members of the Committee for the First Amendment, a group that supported the so-called Hollywood Ten, screenwriters and directors who were blacklisted after refusing to divulge whether they were members or not of the Communist Party. Uh, I'm, I'm not too familiar with that, but they were his friends. He supported them. They said they weren't members of the party, and Sinatra supported them. Sinatra's FBI dossier reveals a dismaying situation, writes historian Gerald Meyer. At no time does it contain anything that even hints at an activity disavowed by the Bill of Rights. Meyer, who documented Sinatra's support of progressive causes and his public confrontation of things like racism and the McCarthy-era Red Scare, sees the FBI files as evidence of a government that perceives Sinatra as a threat. Why would he be a threat? The FBI didn't always focus on the singer himself. Sinatra was such a high profile star, he was regularly targeted by people who wanted to extort or blackmail him. That's true. I remember my father telling me a situation uh, with Sinatra one time. That's true. But listen, you know, when you're in the public eye like that, you've got money, you're always a possible target. So Sinatra, obviously, he was one. In 1963, those seemingly random attacks became all too personal when three men kidnapped Sinatra's son, Frank Sinatra Jr. I remember that. The FBI told Sinatra to wait for a ransom demand, pay it so that the Bureau could track down the money and the kidnappers. Sinatra Jr. was freed when the kidnappers became cagey about their crime. The FBI soon caught the abductors. All three were convicted. No money was paid, by the way. Sinatra knew the government was tracking his activities in 1979 and 80. He requested and received his FBI file through the Freedom of Information Act. His file never ended up getting him in trouble, but it reflects the power and influence of the charismatic singer. He was the biggest guy of, of, of 
generations. I don't think there was anybody bigger than Sinatra. Carried more weight, was more public, was more, uh, uh, more of a star, you know, as an entertainer. He was amazing. Though it's full of references to his shady dealings and thuggish friends, it also shows him speaking out against racism and on behalf of democracy. He was a patriot. Even Sinatra's professional triumphs were enough to get him reported to the FBI. The file begins not with an account of his mob ties, but with a letter that complains about the shrill whistling sound produced by Sinatra's fans. The FBI is talking about the shrill sound of the fans that were swooning over him. Why would that be in a file for the FBI? How easy it would be for certain-minded manufacturers to create another Hitler here in America through the influence of mass hysteria, wrote the anonymous informer. Could you imagine comparing Sinatra to uh, a possible Hitler because of the fans that he had? I mean, fans were rabid. If you go back and look at some of the old clips of Sinatra, I mean, women fainting, swooning over him. But how do you in any way relate that to his, him possibly becoming somebody like Hitler? Crazy stuff. They intend, they intend to get a Hitler in by first planting in the minds of the people that men like Frank Sinatra are okay. Well, he is okay. Sinatra, it seemed, could attract attention of conspiracy theorists and Bobby Soxers with the same crooning voice. And through his career, FBI agents listened as intently as his closest fans. Amazing. 40 years a target of the FBI and uh, a huge dossier on him. So one of the greatest entertainers that ever, ever lived and I don't think anybody will deny that. I mean, I still love listening to his music. Um, my kids, you know, Dad, you know, Sinatra. Well, hey, that's how it is, and I'll listen to it until, uh, you know, I listen to the trumpets in heaven, hopefully someday. So anyway, that's it today, uh, for today. Frank Sinatra, you know, an icon, one of the greatest entertainers of all time. And uh, I know everybody my age and my era certainly misses him. So... That's it for today, my friends. How do I leave you? Same way, always. But before I do that, I got a surprise. We got two questions that we're going to ask, and this is right from your comments on YouTube. Two questions we're going to answer. Let me correct myself. Okay, the first question is, is it true that Henry Hill might have been involved in the murder of a police officer back in the 1980s? Quite honestly, I never heard that. This is the, uh, the first I'm hearing of that. And I knew Henry quite well. I knew people around him, spoke to him, you know, after he became an informant. Um, I never heard anything like that. So I'd have to say it's not true. And if it is true, it's certainly not something that's widely known. And, uh, you know, he became an informant and he gave a lot of information in order to get immunity. If they were tracking him for that, he probably would have admitted to it also. So I don't think there's any truth to that. Next question. How did my father get involved with the mafia and what year was that? Well, my grandfather, you know, they called him, uh, his name was Carmon, but they called him Tutti the Lion. He uh, immigrated here from Italy, you know, back in, I think, 1901, 1902. He had 19 children. Uh, my dad was one of 19 kids uh, with my grandmother. They're all the same woman. And uh, there were four boys, 15 girls. And my dad from early on had these kind of tendencies. And my grandfather had a bakery in Brooklyn. And a lot of the guys, you know, made guys would come and hang out with my grandfather because they respected him quite a bit. He didn't want any part of this life. He really didn't. My dad was an amateur boxer. He used to fight a little bit. He was a tough kid from the time he was young. And he caught the eye and the attention of a lot of these made guys. And they wanted to use him. And my father went to my grandfather and told him about it. My grandfather advised him against it, said, you're not your own man. You get involved with that. You're not your own man. I advise you not to. But my dad, you know, this was his desire. And he started hanging around with, uh, with some guys. I'm not going to mention their names. Before long, they uh, proposed him. There was a story out there that my dad was made at 16 years old. That's not true at all. My dad was in his early 30s when he got made. Um, I don't know where that came from. But he was around for quite some time. And uh, I don't know the exact year. I mean, in 1930s, uh, he probably was in, if he was if he was 32 or 33, probably would have been sometime in the in the uh, late 40s. So that's the best I know. I mean, I don't go back that far, but that's uh, kind of my dad's story. So that's it for today. How do I always leave you? Same way. I'm never going to change. Be safe. Please be safe. You hear what's going on? 
these crazy gangs in Chicago, New York, out here in California, gangs, teenagers now, because there's no laws anymore. They don't get in trouble. They're ransacking. They're hurting people. They're clearing out stores. Walmart's closing down. San Francisco's become a danger zone. The same in Chicago. Be safe, ladies, especially. When you walk the streets, you got to have eyes behind your head. That's just how it is. I advise all my daughters, my sons also. Be safe. Be healthy. Take care of yourself. What could I say? You know, now I'm hearing there's another COVID strain. I think that's over. We don't have to worry about that, really. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless every single one of you. And yes, I'll see you next time.